Good day, Tom. First of all, let me thank you for agreeing to do this video interview with me over Skype. Hey, Guy, thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity. Nice to talk to you online. Thank you. And can, for our audience, would you please introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about where you grew up and what you went off to school to study, and, and then we'll get into the rest of your uh, career progression after that. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, I, I'm Tom Graham, and I, uh, I have a consulting company called um, Graham Consulting. Um, that's stretching my memory to go right back to uh, where I went to school. But I, I, I grew up about 20 minutes, I suppose, from where I am right now. Um, I just we just moved back to this area, uh, maybe uh, six months ago or so. But um, I live in St. Catharines. I grew up in a small town just outside of Niagara Falls in Canada, and uh, I left in God 1977, I think. And I went to uh, McMaster University to do an undergraduate degree in um, psychology. <coughs> and when I think back to that now. Uh, that was probably an early introduction to a lot of the stuff that I do now. Even some of the models and ideas that came out of that undergraduate program in psychology, I kind of use in my work now. Um, but it was in it was more of a scientific or a, um, an experimental approach to psychology. So those were kind of the days, maybe the last gasp of sort of uh, uh, behaviorism in psychology. But there was some. It was. I remember having very good professors there and. One program was in at the I think the the, the class was uh, the science of learning and behavior. It's fantastic, right? And uh, but at the same time, uh, cognitive psychology and cognitive science was kind of making its way into the academic world. And and uh, um, at the same time, I was learning. I think I remember even I had a textbook from Donald Norman. You know, the guy who wrote the design of everyday things and. Uh, um, there were a few other sort of cognitive scientists like Endel Tolving that kind of influenced cognitive approaches to learning that are still influential now. So that was a great, that for me, that was a great foundation. So that was like late 70s, early 80s for me in a master university in psychology. After that, I went to, uh, I did a graduate degree in um, educational technology and it was at Concordia University in Montreal. And that was a fantastic experience as well. And that was kind of the, I guess, the foundation of the platform that kind of took me into uh, training and development in the workplace. Um, but uh, yeah, that was in, that was educational technology. But in the era where where you know microcomputers were really just emerging, right? So I was interested in, at the time in educational television and some early. Uh, sort of computer-based approaches to learning, but some of that was even still on a mainframe, right? So we were designing like pixels on a, on a screen. Um, in any case, that was a, a great foundation as well. And it had um, uh, elements of sort of uh, European approaches to it's like systems approaches to education and thinking uh, combined with, uh, you know, sort of American, maybe more behavioral approaches to um, instructional systems design that kind of emerged out of the military and those kinds of things. So it was a nice mix for me. And uh, you know, anyway, those were it's kind of the, uh, the 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 foundations of uh, what I guess we might call human performance technology or educational technology now. And a lot of a lot of what came out of that ed tech program in um, in Montreal, I I still use in my work now. Like we were just talking a little bit before the call, that kind of systems approach to education and instructional design that was a foundation of that program. I found a link to that uh, later on when um, I started, when I found uh, Rumler and uh, Dale Brethauer and some of those folks. It was a nice, it was a nice connection. Um, anyway, that was, uh, that was sort of the, the origins at that time. For well, me. Very cool. Thank you for sharing that. Let's uh, before we talk about uh, from your the end of your educational period. Let's talk a little bit about what you're doing now. So, Graham Consulting. What's that all about? What kinds of things are you doing? And then let's go back in and fill the gap about how you got from your educational experiences to where you are now. But so, wh where are you now? What are you guys? What do you do? Yeah, it's really it's been a couple of years for me. I I do basically independent consulting now. Um, Graham Consulting. And uh, I, I focus sort of on the uh, on the strategy, learning strategy, performance strategy, and high-level design, 
you know, curriculum design, um, a program level design and evaluation. And then, you know, when, when there's a situation that requires some development, whether, whether technology or traditional, I, I typically partner with colleagues that I've worked with over the years, um, or with a, a digital development agency that can sort of develop something quickly and, and to scale, right? So I'll do the design work and the interface with the client work and then partner with people to do um, the, the development. And that's, that's, that's more or less what I'm doing now. Well, very cool. Thank you. So let's pick up then. So when you were done with your education, where, where did you go? What was your, what were your first jobs and can you can take us through a career progression and and if there's some interesting work that you did uh, at those jobs, tell us a little bit about that, if you will. Yeah, yeah. I think some of the the early experiences that I had um, in in the training space um, were were influenced. The, the people that I was I was working for were influenced by some of the approaches from human performance technology. So. One of the early jobs that I had coming out of that graduate program, in fact, it was actually an internship for that program, but it, but it evolved into a full-time job, was with um, one of the, um, the banks in, in Canada. And the guy that I worked for, <clears throat> his name was Sandy Douglas, he's passed since then, but he was, he was a, an influence for me very, very early in my career, but he was a, a mega um, uh, advocate and uh, he, uh, the Criterion Reference Instruction. So we were doing a lot of uh, developing training for various roles in, in the bank. And he had a methodology quite, um, he, it was very defined, you know, and it was based on, on Mager's approaches and very form-based and that kind of thing without any real technology at the time other than the technology of Mager's process. And uh, so that, for me, that was, a, that was an early introduction to taking some of the structured ideas around instructional design from the graduate program I was in and sort of converting those into a based approach for training and business. And that was very interesting. And uh, around that same time, and and based on sort of one last course that I was taking in this graduate program, it was so the, the program was more focused on on uh, uh, instructional design in education, higher education, etc. But this one course that I took was education instructional design in business and industry, right? And one of the readings was, I can't even remember now, it might have been, I think it was a mega reading, I think we were talking about needs analysis and it might have been on sort of Mager, Mager's performance analysis approach there, but whatever was in that article led me to, um, I think it was maybe a reference in it, or maybe a discussion with my professor, I still can't remember, but it led me to Gilbert's Human Competence, <clears throat> the book. Um, Gilbert's Human Competence. I didn't know a lot about Thomas Gilbert at the, at the time. But at the same time I was doing that internship, internship and using Mager methodology, I was plowing through human competence. And I know a lot of people talk about that book. I mean, we're, we're talking here about, about sort of HPT, et cetera, and, and Thomas Gilbert was sort of a, a real foundation there. Anyway, people talk about how challenging that book is to get through, but I, I just devoured it at the time. I just, I, I really loved it. I found, even as I was working, there was direct relevance. I didn't find any kind of um, ideas in the book that were beyond what could be truly applied at, at work. And I, that's what I really liked about it. It, it had a, a real strong research foundation, plus all of Gilbert's ideas, you know, that were in there. And there's just like a, a million of them, little sort of tricks and approaches to how to how to um, apply basically behavioral and cognitive science to work. Right. That's what that was the foundation of it. But anyway, I'm just saying that that was an early an, an early sort of entry in a way into the models and methods and personalities of um, of uh, human performance technology, right? And also at that same time, a guy I can't I I, I I this is just popping into my head now. There was another sort of department in that same bank that I sort of moved on to after um, <clears throat> that first um, internship, and it was with um, another group and uh, a colleague of mine from that same graduate program, Hannah Meyer. I'm not sure if you know or if you met Hannah over time, but uh, Hannah was uh, a um, uh, a follower, and, and he, she worked with Roger Kaufman quite a bit. Now, Hannah was my manager 
in that in that in the bank at that time, right? So, in in that particular group, we were we were using some Kaufman methodology to identify needs that we could then sort of draw um, training uh, needs out of, right? So, <clears throat> in that, in those early days, again, I was kind of exposed to Roger Kaufman, and then in doing that, even as we were talking about uh, not that long ago. Um, I started to realize there was like, you know, sort of internal battles between, you know, the models within uh, the uh, ISPI uh, or the the early uh, innovators in ISPI. So that was interesting. And I liked all that stuff. And it kind of drew me into some of the early, I'm calling it ISPI, um, but it was became NSPI after that. Right? So anyway, those were some early introductions to um, uh, HPT for me. That's it. that's interesting. Your comments about human competence. I was given that book in 1979. My first week on the job, I was given Maker's uh, Analyzing Performance Problems, or You Really Ought to Want It, which I devoured. And then I went and bought copies to give to all my best friends from college who wrote me through the U.S. mail system because this was 1979. They said the equivalent of basically, "What the hell is this book all about? Why'd you send it to me?" But I was just so excited about that. But human competence with, I struggled. It took me my third attempt to read the book to get through it. I eventually started telling clients, start at chapter 10, read to the end of the book, and then circle back and go read the front of it. Um, I did not have the educational grounding that you had for it, so I had less of an appreciation for it. And it just didn't set me on fire, but I learned to love it. I learned to love the, be not the behavior engineering model, which everybody else, you know, kind of focuses on, but the behavior model for creating incompetence on the page before the behavior engineering model, I would show that one to my clients first, and they would look at that and go, "Oh, I'm doing. That's what we're doing." <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I flip the page and show them that one. They go, "Oh, okay." But but we used to hand that book out to our clients and say, "You know, this is kind of where, what we're all about." Until we had our own books or, or things to hand out here. So tell me now, where did you go after the bank? So you got exposed to you know, the, the Gilbert and Kaufman. And yeah, there were all these, this infighting as these guys who were all very competitive, all very friendly, but still they wanted to say, you know, my model, my language, my nomenclature should, you know, be the, the one. And uh, <clears throat> I don't know if that was really good or bad for the evolution of the technology overall, but uh, uh, so where'd you go after the bank? Yeah. Yeah. The, really the, the first half of my career, uh, it was was kind of on the on the inside of organizations, right? So, mm -hmm. um, I spent some time at Honeywell. <coughs> that was very interesting because um, we developed uh, there was one very big project. We de we developed a computer based system, training system, program f for the Canadian military in instructional design. So we were it was a circular kind of thing. We were training. Canadian military instructional designers, right, in the process of instructional design. And it's almost funny to think back on it, Guy, because like we, this was a computer-based training program, and it was a green screen thing, right? Yeah. We were, it, it, was, it was right around the time, I remember when Apple had just introduced the Lisa, and we had a Lisa kind of sitting over in the corner, kind of predated the Mac, right? And we were all fascinated with that and drawing on it, et cetera, right? And then we'd have to go back <laughs> to these ancient mainframe green screen things to develop like really you know, rudimentary kind of kind of uh, e-learning. But that, but but the methodology behind it was still quite relevant, you know. And uh, so we used we used a lot of you know Mager, and I, I remember actually. Even, I'm just thinking of this now. The guy who was sort of leading that program was uh, Gagne, um, advocate, right? So we ended up using um, Robert Gagne sort of as an approach for that program. That was my, <clears throat> just as, <laughs> it's, this is going to spark a whole bunch of little memories, but that was my first little inclination that <clears throat> the, de the, the highly detailed orientation of some instructional approaches could kind of take you off on, these bizarre little rabbit holes and tangents. We spent days 
guy, I would say that because this, this manager we had at the time was so focused on getting the objectives right. And these sort of Gagne style objectives that were very similar to Mager's had to be very, very precise, especially in this kind of military environment where that kind of thinking tends to find its way, right? Um, mm -hmm. uh, we, we would lose hours and day by today's standards if we spend as much time just developing perf simply performance objectives to then get approved by other guys in the military that were looking at their version of performance. We went back and forth on that stuff forever. So to me, that's a caution. Like I would, I could have shot my brains out sometimes just spending time getting those objectives perfect, right? Which was unnecessary. But I, don't know, I suppose this is opinion at, at a certain level, but um, it was it was absolutely unnecessary for the quality um, of that program. And I think those are some of the holes that people can poke a little bit in some of the uh, uh, highly rigid approaches to instructional design, especially these days. Um, I've written a little bit about that on my own blog, but. Um, anyway, it, you need to go through, I believe, you know, you need to go through those kind of more, more detailed and rigid approaches to understand what the actual issues with them are, right? Uh, because anybody coming new to it now, it's a little bit, the approaches are a little bit more open. That's a good thing. Sometimes too open. So that pendulum kind of swings back and forth quite a bit. Anyway, that was a little detour. That was at Honeywell. Um, and then, uh, I spent some time at Spar Aerospace, which is where we first connected. I'm not sure if you recall that guy, but um, when I was at Spar, um, we were uh, I, I had the task of doing a, a number of sort of needs analysis and organizational needs analysis, and I was working in HR at the time. And uh, you know, I, I think most of us know there's that kind of difference between an, an HR approach to analysis and kind of the uh, a training function or a, maybe a, an HPT approach to training needs analysis. So I, my view was to bring what I was had learned over time was the, appro the approach of Gary Rumler in terms of sort of starting from the, it was kind of a top down thing, which I might not do as much now, but um, anyway, I was very, uh, uh, I, I liked the work of Rumler and uh, I believe you were with Svensson and Wallace at the time. And, uh, mm -hmm. and then I remember coming across the, the uh, um, group process that you have for curriculum design, <clears throat> which I've done many times since then. Um, but that was my first crack at it at Spar Aerospace. So um, using that group process to curriculum design, that was an interesting um, learning of that process, which is sort of, has a lot of Gilbert and Rumler kind of built into it. I think you probably agree. And, um, um, and then also while I was at Spar, uh, there, that was kind of the heady days of process improvement and total quality management. And SPAR, I'm sorry, I should t say what they are. SPAR was, uh, was uh, a systems engineering organization, it, and it was the company that developed the Canada arm that's on the, Canadian, that's on the space station, you know, the big arm. That, uh, and so I had a chance, actually. That was a lot of fun. I just, as another side, I had a chance to operate a simulated version of the Canada arm, which is very interesting. But um, anyway, so... At, while I was at SPAR, um, because this, there was, I was doing this needs assessment using sort of Rumler-based methods, um, but the organization wanted to do some process improvement on another part of the, um, in another part of the business. And so, because I was doing this work and it had been received well, um, I suggested, in, instead of going sort of a full-on TQM kind of approach, I suggested wanting it take a look at this work that Gary Rumler is doing. He had written, I believe, at by that time, the White Space book. And so um, we ended up bringing Gary in. Oh, also at that same time, I had already, I had taken the performance design course from Gary, and Gary himself had come up to teach it because there was a, a Canadian group um, that were sort of spin-offs of Kepner Trigo at the time here in Canada that had started... Um, a Canadian arm of the Rumler Bracious so, uh, so, uh, group, right? I, I know we're using a lot of terms here. You're familiar with them, but us, the viewers might not be. But uh, when the Rumler Brace group, there was a Canadian organization, a couple of guys that were doing it here in Canada. So I was working with them a little bit while I was at uh, SPAR. So they're the ones who sort of brought Gary in. And that was great. Um, SPAR Aerospace was a bunch of engineers, right? 
And and Geary's approach, as anybody knows, is kind of very engineering oriented, detail oriented, very specific process flows. Um, so it was like just a melding of the minds in a way. I've learned like I'm a, I'm personally attracted to uh, an, an engineering approach. My father was I'm I'm attracted to it, but I also guard myself against it. Now, I find sometimes that especially it, 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 that highly detailed approach, especially in today's context, can take a little, can, it, it, it can take time. Not that that's a bad thing. Sometimes you need time to get it right. But the emphasis on detail sometimes misses some of the human element that is very important when it comes to the kind of work that we do. Anyway, that's another side. We can talk about that later if we want. But anyway, it was a melding of the minds between uh, Rumler and this uh, the executive team at Spar Aerospace. And so we had Rumler and <clears throat> through his Canadian operation come in and do some process uh, redesign there. And then as a result of that, I ended up doing, I guess, what we would call now a little side hustle. You know, but... Uh, for the Canadian Rumbler Brace Group, the, they were doing tons of work at at Northern Telecom at the at the time, um, and uh, I had a little Macintosh at home, and I loved doing those, you know, process diagrams. So, for them, they would bring their great big wall charts to me, and I'd take their wall charts and stick them up in my basement and get my little Mac out and do and and document their process flows for them. So for me, that was a lot of fun, and kind of the back and forth of learning how to document a good process flow was was interesting was interesting for me. And I've used that that kind of systems approach and documenting workflow, and I uh, many times, you know, since then. But as as much as sort of using it and documenting it, I use it as sort of a maybe what what we would call today a mental model. You know, uh, that's the way I think about work as inputs, processes, outputs outputs having value and the kind of the accomplishment sense that Gilbert might bring to it and focusing on accomplishments. And that's always a challenge. It remains a challenge when you're dealing with, um, you know, managers and you're putting together a training program these days is to focus on the outputs. What are the outputs? What are the accomplishments? What's the value of them? And let's use that as a filter to prioritize what we actually want to develop some skills in, right? That's always an interesting and challenging conversation to have to this day, I think, right? Anyway, that, so that was at Spire Aerospace. And then after that, and I'll, I'll end here, um, this was sort of the end of my first half of my career. I spent quite a few years at Hewlett Packard. And uh, we, this was Hewlett Packard Canada. Uh, my, my first year there, I was working primarily in Canada, did a lot of work in sort of management development and HR kind of development. And at that time, I was working for a manager who was very steeped in organizational development. Right. So I started to and that, you know, we might think of it sort of as the, the larger organizational picture. Peter Senge had written his book on organizational learning that time, at that by that point. So I was, I was very influenced by that. Again, back to the systems side of things, though. Um, and uh, at that time, I started to read a lot of um, uh, Marvin Weisbord's um Productive organizations. I'm not sure if you've ever seen, if you're aware of that book, guy. I'm just sort of walking over to my library here. Here's the here. You guys, you see that? There's the book there. Yes. Uh, it goes back. It's probably a you know 80s book or so. But from an organizational development perspective, I started to. I was very influenced by by this book, and I recommend it highly to anybody in our, in our profession. And you'll find links there. There's a lot of written in there on Kurt Lewin, and and I found links between what Lewin did and what Gilbert did, even in terms of the influence of behavior on. Uh, sorry, of environment, the influence of environment on behavior, um, versus always talking about skills. And we still have that debate all the time now, right? Um, anyway, so while I was at HP, um, I. Rumler found his way into HP as well, and so there was uh, people that were on in the group that I was working with that were doing some work with Rumler and process improvement. And um, in fact, I remember I, I did a, a, a program there, which was kind of like an orientation program. It was called HP Works, but it was it was what I did was, you know, using uh, Rumler's mapping methodologies. Right, I I kind of created 
at a very, very high level, the entire workflow of, of, of the operational side of, of HP at the time. And then sort of friendly it up a little bit, right? And, uh, and, and we ended up creating a video, which was based on the process flow. And it was received very well. Um, it ended up going sort of international within the, uh, HP, wor with the HP world. And uh, so that was very rewarding for me. And again, a direct application of, of um, uh, it was primarily driven by sort of rumbler syncing, but I, but friend, and that was my first experience in friendlying it up a little bit, right? So not, not so, you know, hardcore engineering driven, right? Um, anyway, and then that was sort of the end of the first half of my career. That was all. And, uh, you know, you, you learn a hell of a lot um, working on the inside of organizations, right? You learn what works and what doesn't work. You learn how politics can get in the way of, you know, truly effective methodologies. You, you, you learn that you need to sort of implement what is kind of the norm in your organization. Um, sometimes you got to hold your nose and do it anyway. And in doing that, you learn maybe what works from those methods that you kind of poo-pooed a little bit because you get a little too grounded in what you think is best, right? And uh, so those are all excellent lessons for anybody, I believe. Um, work inside an organization for a good chunk of time before you start to do any kind of consulting. You need, you need to understand really what your clients are experiencing and what we today might call empathy, you know, for that, those perspectives. Um, we call it then back, we call it empathy. It was called empathy back then too, except we just, we weren't really hearing it so much. But that's what I mean by letting sort of other approaches like uh, organizational development and for me these days design thinking and lean thinking, letting that influence and, and shape what we learn from what, what our grounding is in instructional design and HPT so that it can take another, another form, you know, something that might innovate, right, and move in a different direction. I, I really think those things are important not to get so grounded and uh, end up in those kind of, you know, pseudo-religious wars about what model is better than another model, right? Um, anyway, so that was the first half of my career. Um, geez, how much did I spend on that? That's the problem with working too long, guy. <laughs> well, no, this is exactly, Tom, what I was hoping to get from you and the other people that I've interviewed in these, because I think this is helpful to people entering in the field, and it's inter and very interesting for others who've been in the field for a while, but but you sharing these experiences and your lessons learned and takeaways from it is is really, you know, what I'm hoping to get at. But I have to make a comment here about uh, SPAR uh, Aerospace Engineering is that I thought when we first met, you were at Hewlett Packard. And it was because I was doing some work with Hewlett Packard with Christy Westall in the IT okay. world, in uh, information technology Good world. Job. I'd done a couple of my cur curriculum architecture design things, and I thought... You know, we'd exchanged uh, emails, and I'm going to guess this was, you know, in, I'm, tr I'm trying to think of when this was here. This could have been as, you know, 2000, early 2000s or late uh, 1900, uh, 1990s. I'm not sure now. Well, but uh, I, I left HP myself in um, in about 97, 96. Okay. And, and um, I remember, I, Christy was on the same team that I worked on. And so I know you were working with Christy, but you and I, definitely connected at least over the phone guy when i was still at spar in fact i think we had your your colleague ray ray Smith. Right? yes um yep he came up to do to do an ip because i was involved in ispi in toronto we invited him up to do a session at ispi in toronto um just just the local chapter and uh and i do remember that's when i had first i think i talked to you a little bit about the the group-based curriculum method mm -hmm. we just talked on the phone about it um, mm -hmm. So that's when we first talked. Um, we may have connected again at HP, but I know you were working more directly with um, with Christy at that time. Yeah. At yes. that HP, um, I, I ended up doing a lot of uh, uh, training support for the quality function. And so that's where, because <clears throat> I know you guys uh, at Spencer and Wallace and, and you yourself were very aware and influenced by Deming and a lot of the what was TQM or, or, you know, what it wasn't even, it wasn't lean at the time, although lean might've been just emerging, but how that influenced and overlapped in many ways with, with the objectives or the missions of HPT. Right. So, um, I, it was the same for me, you know, so when, when I started to learn a lot more about 
a quality and process improvement um, that I first started at SPAR but then spilled over into uh, HP. Um, I ended up doing a lot of work you know, on the periphery a little bit of uh, quality and uh, in what in process improvement and process reengineering at the time was all kind of coming out and and uh, uh, that happened a lot when I was at HP and I know you guys were doing some of that work too yeah well again thank you for sharing that so now so let's go back down to the second half of your career once you left working inside the organizations and I think your point is well taken here Pete People don't often understand what their clients are going through because they've not been there and done that themselves. So if you've ever had to deal internally with the politics, you know, getting your vendors paid, dealing with the stakeholders who don't know exactly what they want, but they'll know it when they see it. So try again, that kind of stuff um, and the frustrations that you can have. But but so at, so after HP, where where did you go? What Tell, tell us a little bit about yeah, that. This was an interesting little uh, detour that I took at that time. Um, when I was working at HP, I was uh, the last the last few years I was working with the uh, the California group. So I'm, the HP Canada and US had kind of merged from an organizational perspective. So my team became the US team, uh, and uh, I was traveling a lot. My kids were young, and it just it was just it was just a little too much. So I thought, well, maybe I'll look for something else in in Canada, a little closer to home. And so I did that, although in the end it wasn't a little closer to home. I ended up <clears throat> taking a position, which would, which is unusual at the time, but I ended up uh, directing um, uh, uh, an applied research center at a small university on the east coast of Canada, Mount Allison University. And um, I had always been interested in, in the higher education, um, and I, I really I just... On a whim, it was a friend of mine that was working out there, Rory McGreal, who's I think still he works at a distance education university now in uh, in Alberta. But um, he he sent this opportunity to me, which was for this kind of unique uh, government, business, and the university intersection that wanted to do some set up a center that had some government funding that had some involvement from industry and could start to shape the uh, the e-learning and technology-based learning um, uh, industry in on the East Coast, right? So all to say this was, uh, I was director of uh, uh, the Center for Learning Technologies. So it went back to my roots in, in uh, instructional design and the use of technology in both education and in training, right? <clears throat> Um, and I think that's why they were interested. Like I didn't have the academic background at that time, right? But I think they were interested in me because I had, I had the business background and the companies that were involved in funding and supporting and interested in helping the research out of this was digital at the time, um, uh, NBTEL, which was sort of the the telephone company on the on the East Coast, and um, Anderson Consulting at the time. You know, all three of those organizations have now morphed into something different, but they were all involved in it at the same time. And uh, that was a very interesting uh, period for me. Um, I learned a whole. It was the late '90s, so the internet was really just emerging. Um, we did a lot of very applied research, <clears throat> going back to that discussion we had just before we started the, 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 um, the interview here, um, around the use of technology for both higher education and more and more in, uh, in the business sector. So we did a lot of sort of very applied kind of research into, sometimes it was technology driven, like say the MBTEL might be interested in how to use video for the support of training, right? Um, and how that video could be distributed via the internet, right? Like, like we're doing now, although it was very early days of that. Um, but at the same time, we were doing some work in uh, learning management systems. <clears throat> what, what, uh, in very early ideas around um, social learning, and because the internet was starting to was a, was emerging and creating that um, the possibility for for people to connect both in, in work and in higher education. Um, and those were the areas that we ended up focusing on. And as we were, we were talking about a little bit earlier, um, at that time I was looking for a director, uh, a, pr a project management, uh, sorry, a project 
director that could oversee some of the research that we were doing and some of the learning management system work we were doing. And uh, we were talking about Harold Jarkey a little bit earlier. So I had hired Harold, who had came out of the Canadian military. And uh, so Harold and I, Harold has a very strong following now in his uh, um, uh, personal knowledge mastery, personal knowledge management work. And... Um, but Harold and I worked together uh, for those th three or four years at the Center for Learning Technologies, which was, um, it was, you know, we, we learned some things about how technology be can, can be used to support training at that time that I, that I don't think other people were really focusing on. Um, we were talking about Gloria Geary a little bit early. This whole notion of performance support was kind of coming to the surface. And um, I remember we did a project that was kind of through NVTEL. And uh, we were talking about evidence-based approaches to learning. We did a little bit of research to um, uh, performance-based approaches to, sorry, performance support as opposed to sort of just full-on work on customer, cust for NVTEL on the deployment of some training for their customers service agents as they were sort of deploying a new um, technology. And we spent some time observing how they were doing the work and noticed that they had sort of stick notes all around the edges of the, you know, the classic story, right? You stick all these workarounds, right? And they were sort of ignoring the training and sort of creating their own guidance right? Their own job aids in a way, but they, everybody had their own. So we started to look at those and did some analysis on the commonalities between what different agents were doing and, and sort of came up with more of a performance support based approach to training. And when we did the analysis on it after in terms of the cost that we saved in terms of uh, uh, training that didn't happen, right? That didn't need to happen and the performance that came out of it, you know, it was, a, I think it was a, like close to a couple million dollars that we saved, you know, and that was sort of some, it was research driven. So we spent some time collecting evidence about what was working and what wasn't working. We had the latitude in a way to do that, which was fantastic, right? But at the same time, we were actually working on a very real world problem, um, training problem. So that was, uh, I don't know, that was maybe four years of my life and Harold and I worked a lot together, and we're still in contact, and uh, um, I enjoy the work that Harold is doing, and, um, you know, we, uh, 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 Harold has since kind of m moved more towards sort of broader management topics, and, and very specific, specifically around sort of this um, uh, uh, personal knowledge management, and I think that, I don't know, Harold, Harold can tell you better than I for sure, but I think that might have emerged out of that, the work that we were doing in the uh, around you know use of internet for learning and development right so that was kind of like the the midpoint of, of i wasn't working inside an organization i was sort of doing consulting but i was doing very uh, sort of applied research and learning some things associated with that it came to a much too early end <clears throat> because the university itself um uh, wasn't using the center. We were doing a little bit more external work, and some of the f any any time there's government funding involved in anything, you know, it's going to dry up at some point. So that all kind of came crashing down. But we learned a hell of a lot while we were there, and I personally did. And then I took that into what I guess I'll call the second half of my career, which is more consulting oriented. And I, I did that. I've done that since about I guess the early early two thousands. So it's been quite a while, but I, I left that center and went to IBM. And I, uh, but I worked in the, uh, um, the global um, consulting group at IBM. And uh, we basically did training and learning, consulting and, and development, including a lot of e-learning development at the time for um, IBM's external, external uh, clients. Learned a whole lot there too. <clears throat> hey, guy, I noticed you're you're starting to break up on my end a little bit. Are everything okay on your end? Yeah, no, I'm seeing us fine here. Of course, you're you're in Toronto, and I'm in the uh, Blue Ridge Mountains of North Carolina, and I'm the one with the uh, weaker uh, uh, internet connection. But uh, so far, so good. Yeah. So this has been this is excellent. Thank you so much for sharing this. So, 
So you were in IBM, and so that's where you, you kind of got your, your feet wet in the consulting world, uh, working for someone else. And I imagine that that would have been a great experience because they have the money to get, you know, to, to attract clients who would have big, high stakes kinds of uh, projects because you're not calling in IBM Consulting for the low hanging fruit. So any stories to tell about any particular projects there before you move on into yeah. how you got to, you know, Graham Consulting? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there was a few steps before there. Yeah, so um, IBM was, was very interesting. Enjoyed my time there. Learned a lot about consulting. Ended up with a lot of training and consulting at, at um, IBM. And, uh, you know, the group that 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 I was working with did external consulting sort of at the front end. So we would do needs analysis, et cetera. But there was also an internal e-learning development unit, right? So this was early 2000s. Some, some of the internet was working, but there was still a lot of CD driven uh, uh, training that we were developing. And uh, we did a big project for sort of an unusual client maybe for IBM. It was the uh, Ontario, Ontario, Canada, Ontario Society for Children's Aid Society, right? This was a very interesting project because they were, uh, all of the caseworker training that this, this children's society did was all in the classroom. And it was all very sort of human training. Like it's it's the kind of thing, it's very, very sensitive kinds of um, uh, situations that caseworkers would find themselves in, right? Like trying to work through the decision making process to literally take a child out of a home right this was a very this was very challenging and and um, and uh, important uh, project for us at the time so they were doing all of that training um, in, in class and because there was such a distributed audience this was literally caseworkers from around the province very big province, Ontario, up into the north, etc., working with indigenous populations, etc., right? So a lot of nuances to the pro to the project. Um, uh, but what we ended up doing was, was moving a lot of that training to sort of, at the time, multimedia um, approaches to learning were all the rage. So we started down that path, and it, where I'm going here is there was a learning that came out of that project. So... <clears throat> It was very hard, and one of the one of the sort of the key learnings for me is it's very challenging to kind of estimate the the size of that project, and you know what the hours will be that you'll allocate to it, and of course that all de eventually determines price to the client, etc. But we ended up down a path where we were just overspending and create, you know, because it was such a, an important topic, we were trying to get the video and all the multimedia right, but we were our expenses, our costs were going through the roof, right? So based on the learnings that I had from um, the, uh, uh, the research that we were doing on internet-based approaches and emerging social learning approaches that came out of the work that, we, that I was doing at um, the Center for Learning Technology at Mount Allison University, I, sort of, I applied that to this project at, at IBM with the Children's Aid Society, and we moved away a little bit from uh, independent you know, CD-driven multimedia learning to um, on, online uh, instructor-led learning that was enhanced by certain media elements or, you know, assets or, you know, independent units of, of learning that weren't all bundled into one great big thing, which was a precursor really to a lot of sort of the micro learning approaches that we do today. So um, that saved a whole lot of costs, but at the same time improved the effectiveness and acceptance of that program um, within, with, within the Children's Aid Society. So we still, um, it still allowed them to attend training remotely, you know, similar to what we're doing here. but. Um, we maintain the effectiveness of the program and reduce the cost and uh, still we're able to use multimedia but not in that highly integrated, highly programmed um, uh, structure. Um, anyway, that was one experience at IBM. There was, you know, it was a good experience spending some time there. There was a lot of things that we did with some very good clients while we were there. Um, another one I'll just mention quickly was this uh, uh, 
it was a it was the first time that I'd worked on uh, an e-learning kind of project <clears throat> or a technology driven kind of project for what we might call soft skills broadly. It was a management development program, and IBM developed a I can't remember the name of it. I think it was some boring IBM title like you know managing at 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 IBM or something like that. But uh, we we reconfigured it to sell it to outside clients, right? But it was a four-tier program that included some classroom training. Like, actually, I'll start at the bottom. It had a, a, a bottom tier. I'm just thinking of it at a hierarchy here, but the, it had one tier that was performance support, right? So it was information and guidance, and we used them um, at that time. Roger Shank was kind of making his uh, influence felt, and we used simulations that were developed based on sort of Roger Shank's approach to simulation development. In fact, I think his company, Cognitive Arts, might have been involved in the development of those. Um, and uh, that was one tier, and that put managers, it was all self-paced learning, but it put managers in kind of these very simple kind of scenarios, but it was a, uh, it was, they were elegant because uh, a manager simply had to make some decisions which would take them down a certain number of paths. It didn't require a lot of high-end uh, uh, media, but it was it, it required a lot of high end decision making. You know, so the quality was in was in the uh, um, the the design of the problems as opposed to you know the structure of the media. Anyway, so that was one tier. The next tier was I, IBM had a, um, a a social platform called Learning Space at the time, and uh, 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 cohorts of managers would kind of go through that program and it was kind of instructor led but remote right and then uh, there was a third tier where they had to do um, in those same cohorts a number of case studies but those case studies were were developed together in their groups and then in the final tier they would come together into a classroom to kind of debrief it was kind of very maybe a very early version of a flipped classroom in a way because the content was all kind of covered online before and then they came together to work through a number of, uh, of uh, management cases, right? But that training was no longer a month in duration, it was four days, right? So uh, that was a very interesting model that I'll still use sometimes working with clients now, and, uh, uh, but the approach was very effective, saved IBM internally a whack of money and improve the effectiveness of management development and did the same for the clients who, who adopted it. But, but of course, we would customize it to include their content. And those were the early days of kind of starting to think about content in terms of small assets that you can load into a, a platform, right? So th that was my, my, my experience generally at, at IBM. After that guy, I, I, um, I went to a couple of, <clears throat> like a lot of people did, I think, around that time. Um, uh, digital learning agencies, maybe for lack of a better term. I was with a company called Click Learning. I was uh, a VP of their of uh, a learning initiative, and we did uh, most of our work there in in um, pharma. So that was a very interesting space to work in. We did a lot of uh, um, e-learning that was by that time, you know, internet based, and uh, but it was, you know. Uh, in the kind of that interaction between the disease states, the medications that pharma companies were um, selling and how they address the disease state and sales methods, right? So th those combination of things, we did that, you know, over and over again for a number of different organizations. And that, that was, just, it was an interesting space to work in. I enjoyed that. And then after that, I spent, you know, right up until two years ago, I was with a company called Global Knowledge. You might be aware of them. I think they're they're uh, headquartered out of Raleigh, and um, uh, they purchased a company that I just started with in in Canada, and uh, I was there for a good. I think I was there for nine years, and uh, I I led the uh, the business and leadership solutions group. So I ended up I was doing less consulting that at that point, but I I had a, I had a team of people that 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 did both customization of our off-the-shelf programs, right? Which I had not done a lot of in the past. You know, a lot of the mantra of, of human performance technology is, is custom development, right? So this was customizing a lot of off-the-shelf kind of programs, 
uh, but we had a broad audience for those. And um, I also had a, still had an e-learning unit uh, out of Ottawa, actually, that, that um, developed um, custom e-learning for clients as well. Um, anyway, over time, that, that company, Global Knowledge, became, at least in Canada, more um, uh, suppliers of technology-driven training. And so the kind of work that I was doing on the leadership and custom development side was kind of phased out. So I'm sort of towards the end of my career, and here is here I am doing independent consulting with uh, with um, uh, Graham Consulting, which leads us to the present time. See, that's the problem. Working th over 30 years, guy, it takes at least 30 years to sell the story. <laughs> well, this is perfect, so don't feel bad about anything that you've shared or how long we've spent doing this. I, I, this is what I love to hear. Um, so you you wrote something about sprints recently uh, within the last, I don't know, 12 months. I can't remember exactly when this was, but I thought, aha, I have to move you up on my list for these videos because you've been on my list for quite a while, quite frankly. I just have a hard time uh, slogging through it. Um, but so, and that's interesting because you, remi you reminded me about, you know, you're interested in the group process and... So nowadays we have, you know, different language for things that, you know, were being used before because that whole group process came out of the nominal group technique yep. uh, methodology, right? And, and so I kind of adapted that and I can't remember exactly how because that was for me back in 1981, 82. But so talk to us a little bit about, so what kinds of uh, approaches, uh, some of the newer things or older things that you're utilizing at Graham Consulting in your work here and help us, you know, understand, because you've been doing this for a long time, so you're now kind of on some, you're, you know, using some of the newer approaches to things. And so I'm interested in, you know, so how new are they really? Um, what, what are the new, you know, features and benefits of the newfangled way of doing some of these things that we're done in the past, but not by very many people. So a small minority of people were doing things that might have even been considered uh, 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 similar to, you know, design thinking, uh, use of agile, um, and sprints in particular. Talk to us a little bit about yeah. that. Yeah. Well, like you said, I mean, the longer you work in this space, you realize there there really isn't anything new under the sun. There's there's sort of, there are variations, innovations, adaptations. Um, every once in a while, there's something that's brand new. Um, but like a lot of like a lot of people, um, I, I got interested in the uh, the wave. Uh, I guess you could you may call it a fad of uh, design thinking. But um, you know, TQM was a fad at one point too. I always think that for every fad that kind of makes its way into uh, the, you know, our thinking, um, has a little tailwind of stuff that gets left behind that's, that's the real value in it, you know? So the kind of nonsense that kind of goes with it kind of drips away over time, but there's always, almost always, good stuff that gets left behind. And I think we may be reaching sort of peak design thinking at the moment, <laughs> not quite sure. Uh, certainly lean innovation in a way, that Eric Race book, which was fantastic, but it was an application of you know, the origins of scientific thinking and TQM and, and lean to startups, right? The, the culture of startups we have right now. Anyway, I got very interested in both of those things. And, and, and of course, because of all the, everything we've talked to, to this point, I start to see commonalities in, in these n new approaches, right? And design thinking itself has been around forever. It just became popularized, you know, through IDEO and some of the writings um, uh, recently around it, right? So as many of us have, you look at design thinking and you say, wow, that looks a whole lot like like uh, instructional design in terms of its phases. There's new language around creativity and co-development, etc., which are all approaches that make sense um, uh, in our space, right? So, but what I notice is that you know, people will look at, in, from, our, from our profession, people will look at design thinking and either say, ah, we already do that, or they'll embrace it 100% and just start doing design thinking and leave out all of the wonderful evidence-based stuff that we've learned in our space 
over years and years. So what, I, what I've done is I've tried to, especially at least in terms of design thinking, is take what, what we've learned and what we know, the science of what we know, and layer that into what I can see working from the design thinking space. Um, so what I've done is, uh, that what you're mentioning is I've, I've created a process. It's, I'm iterating it right now, so in the spirit of design thinking, right, it's not a done deal. Um, but it's, uh, it takes it's like the broad methodology of design thinking, right, which takes you through to early, very early prototypes and testing those prototypes with real students, with students, with real employees, right? Um, but the front end of, you know, a pure design thinking approach doesn't necessarily include the front end of what, what we do, right? <clears throat> In terms of needs assessment and, and understanding learner needs and that kind of thing before we dive into um, the creative, creative process. So um, that's what I've done. Um, there was a book out not that long ago. Lucky my library is so close here, guy. It was called um, uh, Sprint. It's a fantastic book. It's a very friendly book. It's written by Jake Knapp, who was with Google Ventures, right? So it's what Jake Knapp had done is taking, he took the design thinking process combined with kind of this lean innovation process, um, which focuses on creative thinking and early prototyping and empathy with the, with the learner, like all the things that we've learned about in design thinking. And he created a five-day process for creative problem solving, basically. His focus and the focus of a lot of what his design sprints are, these five-day design sprints, are around product development generally. But people have started to... Um, expand that out into general problem solving. And when I think of, when I first read it, I thought, well, when I think of product development, a lot of what we're developing and learning, has, if they're not products, they have a product orientation, right? We're developing a solution, right? So then I thought, okay, well, how do I take that methodology and infuse it with what we've learned, <clears throat> um, everything we've talked about today? Right, so um, I've created something called the learning design sprint. The front end of it, instead of following precisely what's in Jake Knapp's book or the or the or the design thinking methodology, has you know day one where we're understanding the performance environment and what the problem is, right, and hearing that from the people that are actually doing the work. One of the criticisms I'd say of early instructional design is we come at this thing from an expert point of view. We walk into the situation, we know the answers. Even Rumler used to say, or Gilbert, like we were the doctor, the organization was the uh, patient, and you know we'll diagnose the patient, right? Um, makes sense in a medical context, especially these days, but in a, in a workplace context, what we've learned is you know, employees know a whole lot more about what they're doing. They can tell you their particular vantage point. We might, we should use that as data and filter it through what we know about what works and what doesn't work. So that's the early stage of this, this, uh, this learning design sprint, as I call it. So there's day one. Day two is a little bit more focused on um, what the knowledge and skill needs are that fall out of those performance models. You will recognize this language, I think, a little bit, guy. So the a little. <laughs> the output from day one is what I'm calling a performance canvas in the language of design thinking, but it's very much like a performance model. The output of day two is um, the knowledge and skills that are required to address the performance needs, all derived from this small team working together. Day three is co-creating some solutions, mocking up some solutions. Um, so there's a very rapid process there. Day four then is building a prototype. And I believe, especially in, in a lot of working through the design thinking, we can you can prototype anything, and you can prototype it very quickly, even classroom context, right? So you can prototype a blended learning solution in some way. Day five is then to bring some potential employees in and test that prototype with them, learn what you can out of it. This is even the idea of informal learning that would come out of actually trying something and seeing what works and what doesn't. And then the output of that is, of course, a very early solution that will likely need a couple of iterations to 
to get through to uh, something that's deployable, right? However, that five-day process, even though it's quite intense, you could do it in four or three days depending on the problem. In my experience, I'm not sure about yours, could often, using traditional methods, take months, right? Just because of elapsed time, right? And so we need to get faster and more creative in our solutions. So that's what I've tried to do with this learning design sprint. And it's, um, uh, so it combines the best, what I think the best of um, design thinking, um, lean innovation, some methodology from there, like trying things and see how they work and adapting from there, iterating from there. Um, and the best of evidence-based approaches from learning technology. So it's not just layering on design thinking. I've, I've tried to create an entirely new process that sounds a little bit like um, uh, group-based curriculum design. <laughs> well, yeah. So, you know, I, I, I'm sure I stole those ideas from someplace some, a long time ago, and I know not where they came I from. But uh, a, no, I, I, So I, tell so, – so, so, that That's really some of the origins of it, yeah. Exactly, um, and and actually, I had done my first uh, group process for instructional analysis and design, and somebody said, "Oh, that's the nominal group technique." And then I had to go read up about that, and that was back in '79 when I when I first entered in here, and I have a whole story behind that. But this is about you, not me. So, um, the article that I read, I believe it was in LinkedIn. On, on, so tell so what's the name of that article because I want people to go look for that do you remember it's been it's been a little while I think but I'm not sure now uh, what you might so, be referring to is something that I posted it's just a blog post and I if, okay if we were talking about that little chat we had on LinkedIn I think I included mm -hmm. a reference to the blog post but in that blog post there is a downloadable uh, two-page document on the process. It describes the process, and there's a high-level sort of visual of what the process is. I think that's probably what you're talking about. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so uh, at the end of this video, there will be a slide that comes up that uh, shares a URL for you, and we'll make sure that that leads to your blogs so that people can look for this, and they can probably just search. There, if they're watching this and you want to jump to it right now, it's just gramconsulting.ca and there's a blog page there and gram is g-r-a-m gramconsulting.ca even i make a mistake yes. sometimes <laughs> um, right now not ca yeah. well all right so it's uh, probably time here for me to shift to my second question <laughs> oh my god <laughs> um but we've answered a lot of this so let me uh <laughs> So uh, my question is, your first exposure, which which you've explained uh, to us about, uh, you know, human, so, so I have, a, I'll put a twist on this. So, you know, I call this thing human performance technology. I'm trying to stick to the old language that uh, came out of uh, NSPI or ISPI, although Tiagi corrected me one time and said, you know, we used to call this performance technology. Yeah. And we used to call it performance improvement. Now we're calling it human performance technology. You know, what's up with that? So... You know, it's got a bunch so, of different names. So, ASTD called it HPI. It uh, could be evidence-based practices for performance improvement. But um, so what I'm interested in here, again, to share for our audience, to give them an example, a couple models that they can either adopt or adapt. So how do you refer to this, you know, this foundation that says, you know, we're about the evidence, you know, it used to be called research-based, now, now it's evidence-based or you know, could also be called evidence informed. So there's a bunch of different languages for this, but how do you talk about this uh, with your clients or peers? Yeah. How I talk about it with my peers is probably a little different than how I would talk about it with my clients. Um, but with clients, of course, and some of my clients are my peers, right? So they're, that's a, that's those are the best kind of conversations. But um you know, when you're talking with clients, of course, it's all about it's all about value and and what works and what doesn't work. And uh, so, when you know, when there's a situation that you're looking at or a problem that needs to be solved, or a you know, what well, as often still happens, you know, the the classic in you know request for a training program that might not necessarily need a training program. That's always an opportunity to have that that sort of evidence based discussion. Um, but it's also true these days with, with almost any kind of training program. Um, 
there's a there's a, a lot of focus these days, and there's a lot of requests for things like micro learning and video based learning. And I don't know about you, but probably anybody from our generation will you know you can see the shift in discussion. And it, there's a pendulum. This happens with every sort of wave of technology. Of course, you see it all the time. But there's a shift in discussion to the technology, right? and the media as opposed to really solving a problem. We've lost a little bit of that. Sometimes we shot ourselves in the foot because those old approaches to needs assessment and sussing out a problem took a long time. Things can't take a long time anymore, right? So we need to innovate and figure out, which is part of what the design sprint is all about, and figure out fast ways to get to the same draw the same the same evidence you know draw the same conclusions so um i just find you know some of the focus on media and technology kind of loses that connection to performance and and tasks and competencies i use that term quite properly um and uh so as a result i i think there's a term that's kind of that i've heard that's kind of connected to behavioral uh economics but there's this I think some of the training these days or the small chunks of it or the volume of it is creating sort of an illusion of knowledge or an illusion of skill, right, that isn't necessarily backed up by practice or as we're just, or evidence, even evidence within organizations itself that it's working or it's not. There was something Gilbert said ages ago. I can't even remember where I read it, but he said, like, more training is not better training, right? And... And I, I find that very true today. You know, we used to criticize the, uh, um, the you know, the, the, the companies that would load up learning management systems with a lot of courses and content, right? So more training is not better training. What's, what, what are you targeting that at? And what kind of skills is it actually going to develop? I think we're sort of in the same boat a little bit now. We have a bit more analytics that we love to dig into and kind of figure out where, uh, where training, who, who's using what training. But... Even if people are using it, doesn't mean that their skills are actually improving. I'm drifting a little bit, but uh, this idea of, of sort of this illusion of knowledge and um, uh, an increasing lack of focus on practice and, and development of skills. Skills is a term that's kind of reemerging a little bit, which I like. Um, but I think one of the, uh, and I'll just, every once in a while I'll draw like a little, uh, issue that I've had over time at, with with HPT, the the focus because it emerged in the 60s and 70s, the focus was very much on task oriented work, you know, and and it makes so much sense for task oriented work. But as we've moved into sort of knowledge driven, information based work, some of the methodology there are gaps there. Let's say, and those those gaps around the skills associated with knowledge work that are kind of cross-functional kind of got usurped by the whole competencies movement, which had its own base of research, right? But you know, generic skills like decision making and problem solving that you can take from job to job, I don't think HPT ever really addressed that very well. I still can go back to to some of. Uh, uh, Gilbert's approach, and if you stop looking at the behavior and look at the accomplishments, then you can still think about competencies there. But so that's always still useful. But um, anyway, I'm not even sure where I'm going with this. But the uh, um, when I'm talking with clients or when I'm talking with peers, um, that's kind of the discussion that I uh, have these days. Even when we're talking about a focus on evidence-based approaches to learning. I sometimes, as we were talking about a little bit earlier, sometimes that evidence has come out of psychology labs deep in a university someplace, and the focus is maybe more on learning for education and higher education. And as dead on and relevant as that research is in those contexts, sometimes I think we may be generalizing a little too much and just talking about those approaches to evidence-based uh, learning as opposed to actually applying them and even seeing if they work in a business context. For example, a lot of that evidence has to do with um, how effective tools for uh, remembering and uh, retrieving information from long-term memory and how to, uh, how, uh, you know, you, when you learn in context, learning in context is the best scenario, you know, for retrieval later on. 
Well, sometimes we don't even necessarily in the business world need people to remember. Sometimes performance support, as we were talking about earlier, is a useful tool. There's much less evidence that we hear people talking about in, in terms of performance support than we do around memory, right? Because that research tends to happen in, in um, uh, academic settings, right? So this is what, where I think we need to do a little bit more sort of action-oriented research or research inside the organizations that we work with, that we work for. That's why I love ideas like um, uh, Deming's ideas around sort of little scientific management and Eric Reese's ideas and lean innovation around sort of developing a hypothesis, running an experiment. We need to run our own experiments, right? Um, so if we have an idea about what might work or not work from a learning perspective, we should develop something, try it, collect some data, make some modifications, collect a little bit more data, refine it until we know it works. Um, how we got there, Guy, I'm, I'm not quite sure. <laughs> well, that was, that was so, the, so my takeaway from that is that and what I'm guessing is that you don't use a label to describe it. You talk about what it means with your focus on the results and the behaviors necessary and the environment, but don't label it, which I think is a mistake that a lot of people talk about in the pro in many of the prior videos, you know, people will tell me, well, I call it this. I've had other people say, I don't bring that up at all. Yeah. Unless I'm at a conference talking to my peers, then we can use our own jargon and language. But when I'm talking to the customer, it's all about them. It's about their results, their situation. And it's a mistake to bring up, well, you know, we'll apply HPT or, or information or, excuse me, instructional technology or whatever to this the clients aren't interested in any of that, at least early on. If it starts to work for them, they may want to know more about it, but not initially. You know what? That's a great point. And um, I'll add a little nuance to that, though. Um, I, yeah, I think it's a mistake to use, to use the label of human performance technology in particular because very few people are even aware of it, clients, right, what it is. However, like let's say you're working with a client that is steeped in uh, Lean or Six Sigma or, or um, uh, what they might still call ISD or ADDI or something on the, on the learning side of it. If they're aware of the label and they like to think of the whatever intervention you're going to work on together in terms of that label, then I'm all for it. Like, let's, like I can fit what I'm doing into, into those labels and even modify it to some extent because I even struggle to be honest, with the competition between these various different approaches. That's why I like to look for overlaps as opposed to be so rigidly adhere, adhere to one or another. Um, but uh, so my point is if you've got a client who really likes a methodology, then, you know, find a way to fit what you're doing into that methodology and learn from each other, right? Exactly. Bingo. Exactly. All right, let's shift gears here just a little bit to the to my next question. And uh, you've mentioned a lot of people, and you've you've shown us some books and talked about some resources. But uh, for people entering in, you know, so what are the you know top three, four, five, or whatever uh, people, articles, or books that you might you know remember and you would recommend to somebody new if you were you know at a conference locally and there's somebody who's new to the business and they're just getting into it you know what would you point them to that yeah. that that were influential to you maybe at the start of all of this for you but maybe later on you found something and you think oh that would be great because you've had staff and you probably had to point them to those kinds of resources people and and articles and books that uh, to help them start their climb of the learning curve yeah, that's a fairly long list too. But I, you know, uh, what influenced me early on still influences me now. But of course, there's a lot of a lot of really good books that if anybody was entering the field right now, they'd say that's the one, right? Um, but for me, early on, I'm just because I'm so close to my bookshelf. Go ahead, <laughs> grab it right here. <laughs> uh, go oh, here, it is. Yeah. Um, oh, I see. I see you're wearing pants. Yes, I am. Yes, <laughs> at, least, at least I am wearing pants, right? Um, but this book, I don't know if you can see that there. Uh, yes. This, this series by uh, Alexander Ramazowski. Ramazowski taught in that early program, um, that graduate program that I was in. He did a series of three books that has, it's a systems-based approach to instructional design. 
it, it also serves as a great, uh, because he references so many um, uh, thinkers and authors in, in this space, it's a great sort of overview of, the, of a number of different models. It's very dense stuff, but it's very, very good. And there's methodology in there you can use. You know, the thinking is slightly dated now, but there's a lot of really good stuff in there. But between then and now, like uh, I grabbed this one while I grabbed the other one too. You probably, because you were just saying you were just talking to uh, to uh, Paul Kirshner, I think you were talking to. Yes. yes right. The authors of this book. But I found this one, again, a very dense read, but I think the methodology in it is, is fantastic. This is 10 Steps to Complex Learning. What I like about it from a learning perspective is... Um, is it in, it includes uh, approaches that address what we were talking about a little bit earlier, you know, the broad um, mental models and approaches that you can use, strategies, let's call them, that you can use to um, apply to a number of different jobs or roles that you might find yourself in as opposed to very task-driven kind of stuff. It includes that as well. But, <clears throat> you know, in between, there's like there's some great stuff out there right now, like um, I think Julie Dirksen's book, um, design for learning, I think it's called mm-hmm. stuff, or how people learn. How people learn. I think that's is that. Um, it's been a while since I read that. I know what you mean. I, I I can't. I think it is. It might be. It might be designed for how people learn. I think it might be that. But anyway, our listeners will find that. Um, but I remember being very influenced by um, <clears throat> Roger Shank's early book. I think it was called Engines for Education, and it it. Um, it had more of a focus on, 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 you know, cognitive models for learning for education. Uh, but it, then after that, he wrote books based on the same kind of theories, but for training and development. But I always I like that engines for education book. Uh, it was kind of the foundation for some of the stuff that he wrote later, or at least from my perspective. Um, so those are sort of on the, on the education side of things, you know, on the, on the productivity, human performance, quality, process improvement side of things. I find those all very kind of interconnected as well. And uh, so that the human competence was is just always a book you can go go back to on that front. But I like to overlay that with I think that I mentioned the book earlier, the uh, productive workplaces by um, which is more of an organizational um, development book that was written by Marvin Wiseboard. I like a lot of the uh, the uh, work that's um, uh, in the space of socio-technical systems. Even when Rumler was doing his work, there's a lot of overlap with socio-tech. And you know, just be, <laughs> this, I mean, it's kind of time. It makes it almost looks like I just have these sitting here waiting for them. Right? <laughs> but but I don't. I actually had this one out the other day too. This is like in the space of, uh, of designing high-performance organizations from a socio-technical perspective. This is, uh, this is a book written by William O. Little, very good, called uh, Designing a High-Performance Organization. Um, and then uh, the design thinking book. So just recently, that design sprint book um, from Jake Knapp, and then the uh, Eric Reese book on lean innovation. So those are books that have very little to do with instructional design, but they have a whole lot to do with learning, right? But as as Harold Jarkey might say, you know, uh, work is learning and learning is the work, or maybe flip yeah. around. But this idea, you know, if you want to label informal learning, um, this idea of running our own experiments and learning from them it goes back to Deming. It goes back to Schur, right? It's the PDCA kind of process. It's like come up with a plan, figure out how you're going to deploy it. These days, maybe in very small little increments, collect some data, look at what worked, it, what didn't work, make some adjustments, do it again. And if you just keep doing that process, that that is learning, and um, that's why I like that uh, um, lean. Uh, I, I guess it was called the lean startup by Eric Reese. Um, so you can, I mean, he's talking about startups, but the, the, the thinking, the mental models that he includes in that book, which have resulted in a number of, you know, follow-ons from other authors and even himself, um, are really, I think they're useful for us in terms of um, improving performance. Just for example, like a team, any team, 
should be able to look at their process. They should be able to say, hey, I think there, here, here's a way I think we might be able to do that a little bit better, right? And putting together some kind of plan to try that, implement it, increment on it, and that, that is learning, right? That is learning while you're working. So I think that side of things um, is, is a challenge for our profession because we create this significant separation that's reinforced by our organizations. Of course, like, why would a manager who wants to sort of improve their business processes or um, improve productivity come to the training fund? They come to the training organization because they want training, right? So it's a challenge for us to say, well, wait a minute, you know, and if he's, well, the, there's other parts of the organization that look after quality or that look after process improvement or that look after organizational development. So you create this kind of internal competition, which really isn't helpful for anybody. It's our own little internal political or religious wars, right? And it's, it's, not, it's not, not helpful. So um, where was I going? Um, anyway, uh, but those other methodologies are grounded in learning. That's why even for my own company now, I'm tr I try to you know, have a foot in both of those camps and sort of the, my little mantra is like helping organizations learn their way forward and that can be through formal training, it can be through process improvement as long as you're paying attention to what you're learning from it. If you're just working and you're just kind of maybe learning incidentally, you know, I remember Susan Markle or somebody said, you know, we learn our mis we you know, we, there's a lot of talk about learning our learning from our mistakes. Well, we, we can learn our mistakes in the same way we can learn from our mistakes, right? So if we're not reflecting and processing constantly on, on what's working and what's not working, then we just potentially learn workarounds that, you know, are not helping the organization or ourselves, right? So that's mm -hmm. the kind of approach I try to bring is to, to bring, them, bring them all together. So I think you just answered my uh, next question, which was your 30-second elevator speech. Um, I don't know if you can actually repeat that again here. Well, those of us who can back up the video here uh, in the future here can maybe test you out on that. But so because uh, what I'm looking for are examples that people can adopt or adapt to their situation. And you just gave us one and I wasn't able to write it down because I was writing another note on something else you said. But so if you were to give us again your uh, 30 second or plus or minus elevator speech on what you currently do. Yeah. Yeah, it's um, that little mantra that I use or a little byline is helping organizations yep. learn their way forward, right? So <clears throat> that learning can come from, of course, a formal approach to learning what we would have called instruction, right? And very intentional kind of teaching somebody, which is not a bad word, by the way, right? It's, like, it's, it's fashion. That, that, that approach to learning is not so fashionable anymore, right? Um <laughs> But it is still required in organizations, especially for unique things that that the people working in an organization need to learn. For example, you're not you're 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 not going to go onto the internet and find something about the unique products that your organization sells. You need to learn you need to learn that through some intentional combined with informal approaches. So that's learning. But also, um, learning is also the the what I just described as that kind of iterative, uh, conscious, um, reflective approach to work and running at little internal experiments, right? So, yes. And running experiments is basically performance improvement. Running experiments is what we used to call total quality management. Running experiments is process improvement, right? So those are the kinds of things where we're learning from our work quite intentionally, um, but training which is also a very noble word with a great history to it, which is not so fashionable anymore. Um, in fact, what we call learning mostly these days in training functions is training anyway, based on what we used to call it. Um, but um, so those are, those, are, those are two things that I do in, in terms of helping organizations learn their way forward. And I said at the beginning, what I tend to do though is I focus a little bit more on strategy and design high-level design, and then partner for, for anything beyond that. So shifting gears here again, uh, 
as a lifelong learner, and uh, you obviously are, I mean, you're, you're well read and you've, you've been uh, talking about uh, many of these books that uh, have had impact and influence on you and your practice. But can you share with us, and I think you have, but let's, let's formally you know, address this again then, your current focus or next focus for learning and share with us, you know, what that is. And if they're, if you're writing about that or you have something that others now can go look at. You, we talked about sprints a little while ago, but you maybe, you know, you're iterating on that. So what, is, is that it or are there are, and or other things? Yeah, well, I'm always planning on writing something, Guy, but it, it never it never really results in very much. So I've got a I've got a wicked knowing doing gap. <laughs> I need to <laughs> maybe now that I have time, maybe the coronavirus will give me the opportunity to fill that gap. But um, no, I write I, I I have gone in in spurts writing on my blog. I have I, beyond that just little articles here and there, which are sort of on the blog anyway. Um, so you can find some of that writing, which you know covers some of the things we talked about today. Um, but that blog, I think, goes back to 2008 or so. So there's some, it was long gaps in between <laughs> based on work that I was doing. So um, that's at grandconsulting.ca. Um, other than that, I'm right now I'm, te- I'm also teaching a course in needs analysis at uh, the University of Toronto, um, <clears throat> which is enjoyable. Um, and that I, a lot of what we talked about today finds its way in there. Uh, Gilbert and Mager and other approaches to um, to needs analysis. Um, and the, so the question is, what else am I doing right now? Just the kind of consulting that we were that we were talking about. I'm trying to uh, uh, iterate that sort of spr- uh, learning design sprint process. So I'm looking for partners and clients that might be interested in implementing an, a, that approach. Um, and these days, even virtually. Right, so there's uh, that's, yeah. that's a challenge for a group process, but I think there's an area for learning and iterating right there, um, and so that's that's primarily what I'm doing, and just working with uh, clients on different kind of learning and and um, and uh, uh, um, approaches to performance improvement. But I also, as I mentioned at the outset, I sort of I, I live about an hour and a half out of Toronto right now. And uh, so I'm, I'm living in the middle of a um, kind of, uh, an area that was industrial in the past and is now kind of emerged as a uh, um, uh, uh, more recreational and uh, tourism and our whole, the Ontario wine industry is centered down here. So I'm looking for opportunities in, in that space that's a little closer to home and trying to do more remote work and remote, remote consulting. Mm-hmm. All right, let me shift gears again on you. And uh, this next question is about uh, our language or terminology. And uh, so the, qu- the question is, is there a favorite performance improvement or, or you know, learning term or phrase that you would like to define for us? And, and most often it's not because it's your favorite, but, but perhaps you're annoyed how this term or phrase is being used or misused by by others, and you want to put your own spin on it. So, uh, what have you got for us? Yeah, um, you know, there's, but you like you were saying earlier, uh, terminology and language and jargon. Uh, it, it all has a, it all serves a purpose, right? But it only serves a purpose when the people having that conversation share that jargon and and understand the meaning behind it, then all those shortcuts carry a lot of a lot of meaning, right? Even just talking about human performance or HPT, anybody who's been steeped in that, you know, there is five days of discussion just in that one word, right? But so I don't I don't mind jargon. I think it's incredibly useful. I just have to be careful how we use it. But if I was thinking right now of a sort of a a favorite term, it would be going back to what we were talking about a little bit earlier. Um, I love all the new approaches because my, my, even my own background is sort of using technology for learning. Um, so all the, the new language around micro learning, develop small chunks of learning, um, little explainer videos, these are all fantastic things. Uh, but I'm a little bit worried about, you know, that kind of illusion of knowledge that I talked about a little bit earlier. So the term that I would, I would love to introduce is the simplest term possible and it's practice, right? So, and I, I just 
don't I, I i i have a little worry and it's a caution maybe for our industry that with the development of what we call content and that label content kind of has kind of emerged with internet driven content but content for us is really something that has it's not an end in itself. Our end game is performance and skills, right? So how that content connects to skills is really important. And I think that's primarily through practice. Like we're kind of, we're losing the focus on authentic, um, context-driven practice. Good practice. There's good practice and really shitty practice as well. <laughs> uh, good practice is authentic and it's context-driven. And the, I, I really like the work. It's got its advocates and, and dissenters, but are, are around what, what's called deliberate practice. So that's the term I'm introducing here. It's the work of uh, Eric Anderson. Um, and uh, it's the, the term deliberate just means it's focused on very specific goals, breaking, breaking skills, or even competencies, as we were talking about earlier. Like if, you're, if, you're, if the competency you're talking about is decision-making broadly, well, you can break that down. You know, even Maker's goal analysis is a fantastic way to kind of break down, you know, the fuzzies, right, into behavioral kinds of chunks so that you can focus practice on those, right? So breaking it into chunks, developing authentic tasks to build your practice around, and introducing ways to include immediate feedback, whether that's in the context of training or maybe the system itself. You know, you can build ways that the system the work provides immediate feedback. So much of knowledge work has very delayed feedback. You don't see the results of what you do until way downstream. And because other people are, are, are working on little bits of what you're working on, maybe you never see the results of what you do. You only see your own little chunk of it. That's very frustrating. It builds anxiety. People really, you know, which is just, uh, it's a plague in workplaces at the moment. And I think part of it has to do with people not really having the chance to get really skilled at what they do. So my term is deliberate practice, and you can I have I have a couple of articles on my blog if you want to read a little bit more about it. But I think that's something we can maybe start to focus on a little bit and get innovative in the way we develop and uh, 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 practice for both task-oriented skills, but also sort of human-oriented skills and behaviors. You know? Excellent. Thank you. Yes, I so much agree with uh, you. That's uh, something that, uh, you know, even back in the day, uh, not everybody embraced authentic practice and feedback. And um, it, it, it's to our uh, professional detriment, I think. But uh, thank you for raising that. So my uh, second to last question here for you um, it's kind of a mul you could give us multiple answers on this, but what I'm kind of looking for is uh, stories or shout outs of people that have been influential in your life. And what I, what I was hoping to get here are some stories to humanize some of these people. You know, we may have read some of their articles. We may have heard about them. We may have seen videos on them, but we don't know them as people. So anything that you can uh, share with us about <clears throat> people again you can just do a shout out and but but why so why why are you, why would you shout out so tell us a little bit about it'll give us a little background on that so what do you have yeah, some of those i mean I, I for me maybe working out of canada um you know a lot of the people that we've talked about today are are just people that i've read or i've i've seen at at conferences the ispi conferences or our own local conferences um but, you know, the individual that I've had a chance to work a little bit with and be influenced by in a way that's broader than just what they've written is probably uh, um, Gary Rumler. Um, but <clears throat> I also took a, a, a five-day course on uh, cognitive approaches to training design from uh, Ruth Clark. And, uh, and, and that was very good as well. I think we all we think of Ruth as kind of the... Uh, the, the uh, one of the leaders in evidence-based approaches to learning, and her books are great. They sort of they'll describe experiments in very friendly ways. Um, but taking her course um, from Ruth directly was was great because <clears throat> you know she, her books are mostly focused on principles, right? Pr experiments and principles. But taking those and and designing training based on those 
um, with feedback directly from Ruth and others that were in that class. It was only about 10 of us, you know. Um, <clears throat> some of the templates and tools and the models, even again, just so kind of mental models that you carry with you. You know, in our world, you just try to do as much as you can, right? It's like uh, training is kind of what are the you know, about politics is the art of the possible. I think this, it's true in training as well. It's like you've got constraints. You know, your constraints are always cost and time and, you know, your clients and what can, you know, your, even your learners and where they are. There's a million constraints, right? So how to apply the pr evidence-based principles within those constraints. And the best way to sort of learn those constraints, I think, is talking about what other people have done. Like, how did you apply you know, principle X, Y, or Z in, in your context, right? And that course was a good example of that. So, you know, shout out a little bit to um, Ruth Clark. Um, and uh, this is this is not based on any kind of personal um, uh, uh, connection, but I, I used to really enjoy, I'm not sure about you, but I, I, guy, but I, I used to like uh, the, uh, the, the work that Ron Zemke used to, uh, uh, to, to do. In fact, I still use that figuring things out, you know, talk about labeling, you know, so he didn't call it anything other than figuring things out. Right? Yeah. And, um, <clears throat> but it, it used to be entertaining. I used to, I like people who write and, uh, uh, don't take themselves too seriously and kind of write in an entertaining style. And I always liked the way he wrote. So, uh, shout out to, uh, Ron Zemsky as well. Um, I, I <clears throat> also, um, and this is based on a training program that I, I took with Dana Gaines and Jim Robinson. Um, and I, I, it was at a time, I was at HP at the time, and it was at a time when um, I, I had already been kind of steeped in, in Rumler, and I had already been steeped a little bit in, in um, P, uh, Peter Block and organizational development approaches to things. And then when, when I read their first book, I think it was Training for Impact, it was like, oh my God! They've just sort of taken Peter Block and and Rumler and put them together and kind of added their own layer to it. And uh, but I found that very useful, and I still use those readings in the course that I teach at U of T right now. So Dana Gaines and Jim Robinson were very, uh, very, um, uh, I'd say, I guess, influential early on. Yeah, I, I guarantee. I mean, I've talked about quite a few today, and I don't want to take too too much more time doing that. There's others that we talked about, but. Um, you know, there, there's there's a lot, you know, over a career, there's a lot of things you sort of dip in and out of, and I'm sure I'm forgetting, I'm forgetting some, but, um, oh, well, well, help me, well, help me with something then. So, uh, did Ron Zemke write at times in Training Magazine, because that's where, you know, he was, he was part of that, but was he uh, Johnny Guitar? Do you recall, do you record the, the writings of Johnny Guitar? You know what? I don't know. So you're, <laughs> I have no idea. I don't even know what that reference is. So that okay. That so that just that means I'm just a little bit older than you because I could swear that that it was like Johnny Guitar and then Johnny Flipchart and it was some persona that he was writing about and it was all in fun and he wasn't taking himself too seriously. And uh, but I'm gonna now have to go look at that and and uh, go catch up on the on Ron Zemke and some of his uh, previous writing. Guys are old enough now. I'm not even sure if they're still around or writing anymore. You know what I mean? So, I mean, that yeah. that book was like 83 or something. I don't, you know, but the ideas mm -hmm. in there are still very useful. The references in there are atrocious. And my students will tell me that when I'm teaching this course at U of T. It's like, my God, we're talking about, you know, uh, ne never mind PowerPoint. It kind of even predated that, I think. Like they're talking about flies and overhead projectors and things like that. But um, anyway, that's what that's when we start to date ourselves, guy. <laughs> yes. Well, and that's, you know, you have so much that you've shared with us, and I'm so appreciative of that. So let me let me wrap up our interview here with um, asking for your, you know, parting words of wisdom or guidance for our audience. And, the, and I'm setting this up, but, you know, people new to the field, I don't, you know, whether they're younger, middle-aged, or older, but they're coming into this thing here. So what what guidance can you give them? to help them as they start this journey. Yeah. You know, I, I think it's hard for anybody coming into this profession right now. I, re, I don't envy them because, you know, as much as much um, competition as there was for those models that you were talking about earlier, 
they were all variations of the same thing. And you could slip into that and feel pretty good about it. There was, we had the luxury of a little bit more time to do the kind of analysis that, that anybody new coming into this field does not have any longer. Um, so their challenges are different than what our challenges were, right? So my only guidance to any anybody coming in uh, is is like tr- truly, you know, I'm almost going to say like understanding the foundation that training and training in in the workplace <clears throat> is a means to an end. In uh, like it in education, it it is or can be considered an, an end in itself. But but in the workplace, it's a means to an end, and that end is what you what you would anticipate. It's improved performance. It, organizations use it, of course, to to improve their productivity and reduce cost and all the good things that organizations need to do to compete in the workplace. That's why anybody coming into this space that's working in a, in an organization, that's why they have their job, right? Um, so it's not, it, you can get so deep inside an organization that you can kind of think of your role as exclusively developing people for the good of developing people because it's a noble and good thing to do. And that is true. That is true. But <clears throat> I think that we, if we're going to stay connected to the business and stay relevant, I think training and development right now is struggling with even just its own relevance inside the organization. And the more content that's available outside of, outside of training is is competition in a way and makes the training function less relevant. The way you become relevant is to be very good at developing a the task-oriented skills that are important in your organization to develop and B, to figure out, and this is where I think we need to innovate, is to figure out ways to develop those human skills that are going to be so important in the future. Um, especially as automation makes its way into the organization, right? So what we used to do, Guy, right? What we used to do in our generation, did we developed um, skills in the tasks that are now being automated, right? So people aren't necessarily going to need to learn those skills. They still do at the moment, but God knows where it's going to go. The fu- future skills are more human-oriented skills. And I don't think we have... A, a, um, a strong enough approach for developing those skills. We're kind of banging around social learning approaches, but in the end, you know, more than when we talk about social learning, a lot of it just has to do with, you know, online on-demand content, right? And so that comment I made earlier, like more content is not better learning, more training is not better training. Um, we need to innovate, I'd say. So anybody new coming in, Understand the foundations of what's important to your organization, and there are a lot of the resources we talked about today, plus newer ones that you and I are probably not even aware of. Uh, Get a really strong foundation in those and understand them so you can have these kinds of discussions. Try them. uh, Continuously try them in your organization and learn what you can from them, but understand, always understand that connection to Whatever, whatever the business, whatever the business is, just there always needs to be that connection to business goals. And at the moment that there isn't, you you might not have a job anymore, right? So it's that kind of. Uh, I I would just emphasize that, whatever that is that I just said. Right. <laughs> it's the imperative. Yeah. No, I agree. Th- Tom, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom and insights with us here today. Um, Good luck in your business, and I hope that uh, people follow up and uh, take a look at your website and take a look at your blog and take a look at the uh, products and services that you're rendering to the marketplace. And, uh, again, thank you so much, and uh, uh, cheers. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. Stay, stay safe. Everybody stay safe. Stay home. <laughs> if, you're, if, you're, if you're watching this five years from now, you maybe you won't have any. You'll remember what we were talking about, but uh, uh, that reference will make sense hopefully then. But, but anyway, thank you, Guy, and uh, I appreciate you tolerating my meandering a little bit here today. It was kind of a fun conversation, so I dipsy-doodled all over the place. But yeah, I, It was great. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye.